All right, now John chapter 3, of course, is very famous chapter of the Bible that's used very often for soul winning, for, for giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we started with this today. Now, the subject matter that I'm going to be preaching on this morning, actually, the title of my sermon is called Why Catholics Aren't Saved. There's a lot of people today, and usually people who are younger Christians, younger in the faith, maybe they just got saved recently. I've noted this time and time and time again, even with myself, you have a tendency to think that more people are saved than really are saved. Because you're still a babe in Christ, you're still, you know, it, part of the reason I think is because you realize salvation is so simple. It's just through faith in Christ. Like, like all you have to do is believe on Jesus in order for you to be saved. So you start thinking, look, well, all of these other denominations, all these people, you know, they all claim to believe in Christ, so they're saved too. And it's a very simplistic view. Now, again, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to make this difficult, and you'll see that as we go through the sermon. It's not a difficult concept. But what most people today are relying on, even most people that call themselves, themselves Christian, is relying on is not just Jesus Christ. They're relying on their own works. They're relying on themselves. And this is the whole reason why most Christians, and you know, honestly, the title of the sermon, we could call it Why, why Most Christians Aren't Saved. Because people who call themselves Christians, most of them aren't saved. But, but today, this morning, I'm specifically going at some of the Catholic doctrines. So it's, it's going to be geared mostly towards Catholics, but all of the scripture that we turn to can be applied towards anybody who's not believing the right gospel. So I'm going to read for you this morning. I, I found, you know, it's real difficult to find, because I know a lot about what the Catholic Church teaches Overall, I know I'm familiar with a lot of their doctrines, a lot of their heresies, a lot of what they believe and teach, but trying to find like something official, you know, like from the Vatican or from, you know, from something that would be completely Catholic as just a, this is what you have to do to get to heaven. It's like almost impossible to find, at least online. I don't know. Um, I was having a hard time with it, but I did find this summary and it was not made by a Catholic. I'm going to read this for you because I thought this was a very good summary. And he did a lot of referencing of the, the Catholic catechisms, which is, which is their teachings, which is their official doctrine and, their, and, and what they go on for, for what their teaching is. And I cross-referenced and verified these that they are actually saying what they're saying. And, and most of them I already knew. You know, I know that I've talked to enough Catholics at the dorm and I've done my own study and I was raised Presbyterian. And, you know, honestly, some of this stuff is exactly the same because Presbyterian is just the from the Protestant Reformation, the protest against the Catholic Church, where it's just a reformed Catholic Church. It's still the Catholic Church. It's just been reformed. They've just changed some doctrines. They've changed certain things, but other things they left exactly the way that they are in the Catholic Church. All it is, is is a modified Catholic church. So I wasn't brought up Catholic, but again, I'm familiar. We had to do it, you know, for my, you know, I had confirmation, just like the Catholics have confirmation classes. You know, in order to be a member of the church, you have to go through all this stuff. And we learned a lot of things. Now, we studied more of the, you know, the, the, the Reformation leaders, John Knox, John Calvin, you know, all these, uh, Martin Luther, all of these guys that came out of the Catholic church. But... In, in any case, you know, you could look this, if you don't believe anything that I'm saying here that, oh, Catholics don't believe that, yes, they do. You can look it up for yourself. I've got all the resources up here. You can see them or just go ahead and, and go online or go and talk to your Catholic priest. He'll tell you that this is what the Catholic Church teaches. But um, I'm going to read this for you because I thought this was a very succinct summary about what they believe in regards to salvation alone. And that's what we're going to be covering today. There's, you know, we could go into ton, like lots and lots of heresies, lots of doctrines that they believe falsely. But I want to focus mostly just on salvation this morning. And this was written by a man named Matt Slick um, from the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. This is where I found this article. But I'm just going to read this for you because, like I said, it, it does a good job of, of explaining it. He says, salvation in Roman Catholicism is a process. To begin, God grants actual grace to a person which enables him to believe in Christ and also believe in the truth of the Catholic Church. So there he's saying that essentially it's, it's similar to Calvinism, right? Where, where it's God's grace alone that even allows you to be capable of putting your faith in Christ for your salvation. He says it's God's grace that even enables you to be able to believe as opposed to you having a free will 
and being able to choose to believe on Christ, that, that God's actually like giving that to you um, to be able to believe. He says, after belief, the person must be baptized, which is necessary for salvation. This baptism, and there's a lot of references here. We're going to get into some of these references as I continue on because I'm going to attack a lot of these points individually and show you why they're all false from Scripture. After belief, the person must be baptized, which is necessary for salvation. This baptism erases original sin, unites the person with Christ, infuses grace into the person, and grants justification. After baptism, he is saved, but to maintain his salvation, it is necessary for him to perform good works and participate in the sacraments which provide grace that is proper to each sacrament. This is necessary in order to maintain infused grace. However, grace can be lessened by venial sins or completely lost by mortal sins. Venial sins remove part of the infused grace, but not the saving grace known as sanctifying grace. To remedy the problem of venial sins, the Catholic is to take the Eucharist, which the church teaches forgives venial sins. He must also perform various penance, which must be done in concert with perfect contrition. But there is a problem. Sins require punishment. Even though sins are absolved by a priest, the punishment due to a person because of his sin can remain. To deal with that remaining punishment, indulgences are administered to deal with the punishment due to the guilt of the sins already forgiven. Now, I'm not even done yet. You can see why I was having a hard time trying to find, from, even from a Catholic page, what do you have to do to be saved? This is complicated. Their doctrine is complicated. This is not easy. I mean, there's, this is, and they call it a process. And that's why the Catholics that you talk to, no one knows for sure that they're saved. They don't know. How can you know when you have all of these different steps and rules and things and, you know, and you're always having to, well, now you're saved. Well, no, now you're not because you've sinned again. And it's this continual process. Well, well, now you have to jump through this hoop. Okay, you've jumped through that hoop. Well, yeah, you're not quite there yet because you've sinned again. Now you have to jump through this hoop. Okay, yeah, that saved you. That fixed you. Oh, wait, now, now there's another hoop that you have to jump through. And it's just this continual process of garbage and lies. Well, we're going to get into that, but I'm going to keep, I'll finish off here. Um, it says, uh, to deal with that remaining punishment, indulgences are administered to deal with the punishment due to the guilt of the sins already forgiven. These indulgences draw upon the good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of Christ and the saints, so as to obtain the remission of the temporal punishment due for their sins. Furthermore, the indulgences can be applied to themselves or the dead who are in purgatory. Now, in case the Catholic has committed a mortal sin, then all his infused grace is lost. To regain this grace, he must partake of special penance, since it helps restore grace that was lost. To conclude, the Roman Catholic must have faith, participate in the sacraments, take the Eucharist, keep the commandments, perform penance, and do indulgences in order to attain, maintain, and regain his salvation, as well as reduce the punishment due him for the sins of which he was, has already forgiven. And then it has, I've got all these lists. These are the actual um, references. In this article, there's, every point is referenced with, with their doctrine, with their catechism, with the number, because they have them all numbered. There's like a, a few thousand of these things where they have all these different statements in their doctrinal statements. So he put them together and summarized them. And this is, I mean, anyone who's talked to enough Catholics about salvation knows, you know, you pick up these little pieces. Most of them, a lot of them don't even know really much about their faith. A lot of them aren't that studied. I just recently had a, had a long, extended conversation out soul winning with a man who was, who was open to talking, and I was, you know, I was preaching him the gospel. But he was pretty well versed in his faith, in what he believed, in, in, in the teachings that they teach, which is very rare. And I've been running into more Catholics lately. This is one of the reasons why I'm preaching this sermon this morning, because you know, we need to understand a little bit about what they believe, because when we go out soul winning, and a lot of newcomers, a lot of new believers will fall into the trap of maybe just asking like, hey, you know, how do you know for sure you're saved? And they might answer with, well, I, you know, I believe. 
And people might stop right there and just be like, oh, great, you know, you're saved, cool, and then go on to the next door instead of following up and asking a few more questions. Because when you start asking people the further questions, you say, well, what do you believe? Well, you know, I, they say, I believe in Jesus, right? And then the more you ask them questions, the more you start to realize that's not all they believe you have to do. I'll even ask them, well, is that all you have to do? So if a person just believes in Jesus Christ, you know, is that enough? Can they go to heaven? Is that, you know, and, and a lot of times then they'll say, well, yeah, I mean, you also got to, you know, do something, you know, and, and I'll say, if, if they say, yeah, that's it, I'll say, well, what if a person believes in Christ and then they murder somebody? Are they still going to go to heaven? Are they still saved? You know, and that, th those types of questions will bring out what's in their heart. What do they actually believe? You know, it's easy to repeat something. And oftentimes people will just repeat, oh yeah, salvation by grace through faith. Because they'll hear it repeated over again, but that's not really what they're believing in their heart. They're trusting in something else. So we need to make sure that we're diligent to ask the right questions. But um, let's get into to why Catholics aren't saved. And when I say Catholics, I mean anybody who believes this doctrine that we're putting out. Okay? And if they believe, if any person believes this, they are not saved. This is a long list of things to do for salvation, and it's com contradictory to the Bible. And one of the ways they justify their beliefs, the Catholic Church believes that it's not, the, the only authority does not rest in God's Word. They believe in the teachings of the Church. They believe that, um, you know, Peter was like the first Pope, and that he was given authority to, to make all the, these rules and stuff. And they always go to the verse, you know, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And they take that and run with it and just say like, see, well, they just have all this authority. They could change the rules whenever they want. They get, you know, they get revelations from God. They could say all this stuff. And, and the whole doctrine can change over time just based on what the church teaches. And that's one of the, and oftentimes that is just elevated above the scripture. Whatever comes out of the Vatican, whatever comes out of the Pope's mouth, well, this is the way we believe now. This is the new doctrine. And everything that we see here is just from their teaching. But what we're going to do is, is show how this is contradictory to Scripture. Now, the first point I'm going to start off with is baptism. Because they believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved. That's one of the hoops you have to jump through in order to, to achieve salvation is being baptized. We started off in John chapter 3. Now, I love John chapter 3 for soul because there's so many verses that, that do a great job of explaining salvation. The first one being here in the beginning when it talks about being born again. Jesus Christ goes to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's talking with Nicodemus and he says, you know, verily, verily, I say unto thee in verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's saying, look, you have to be born again in order to see, in order to go, in order to go to heaven, in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And it's not just Catholics that, that abuse this verse. I've seen Pentecostals do the same thing. Anyone who believes that you have to be baptized in order to be saved will actually turn to John chapter 3 because they think that this supports their doctrine. And the reason why they think that is because they have blinders over their eyes and they can't even see what the scripture is saying here. They've been taught a lie and they've accepted it. But Jesus says you must be born again. Now, what I love about that verse is saying, look, when you're born again, God's using an example here. Jesus is using an illustration of being born, of a birth. When you're born into a family, because this is something we all understand. Even if you don't have children, you are somebody's child. You were born into a family. Once you're born one time, you don't have a second birth. You don't have another birthday. You are born physically into this earth one time. You have two parents. You have one mother and one father. And no matter what happens for the rest of your life, you are always your parents' child. You know, they could say, they, they might try to disown you or whatever, but that doesn't change your blood bond, your blood relationship. You are their child. And I love explaining this to people about salvation because it's, it's a great example. It's a great analogy of saying, you know, my daughters, they all have their own birthday. They're born one time. It's impossible for them to be unborn. Once it happens, that's it. It's, it's, a, it's something that, that has no turning back. Once you are born into a family, that's where you remain. Now, I have rules for my children. They don't always obey my rules. For example, sit up. But no matter what they do, they're always my children. Now, they may have to be disciplined sometimes because I want to teach them right from wrong. But no matter what they do, I'm never going to turn the oven on broil and toss them in there and leave them in there forever. 
right? That's not what a loving parent would do. A loving parent, you know, you may spank and discipline your child and it might cause a little bit of a pain, right? But that has the effect of teaching them right from wrong. It has, it has an impact on their life from preventing them from doing wrong things again in the future. It is not to harm them. It's not to abuse them. It's not to hurt them, you know, in the sense of like injure them. It's just a matter to, to, to change their, the way that they're behaving, to change their behavior. So, but putting them in the oven and just, and just torturing them just forever and ever, and ever that's not something I'm going to do to my child. And you know what? That's not something God does to his children either. When a person is born again, they're born into God's family. Now, he's talking about the spirit, and we're going to get into that. I'll explain that in detail based on the scripture. He's talking about our spirit being born again. We're born into God's family. Once we become God's son or God's daughter, when we're born into his family, we are always in his family. You could never, that, is, that is a relationship that can never be changed. We are his child forever. And the same way that I would never put my children in the oven and turn it on broil, God will never send his children into a burning, fiery furnace of hell. That'll never happen. You are safe. Now, is God going to discipline you? Absolutely. Because you're his child and he loves you and he wants you to do what's right. So when you start turning your back on God and just, and just having a stiff neck and not wanting to obey him and just sinning willfully or whatever, he's going to discipline you. He's going to come down on you as a loving father would. But he's never going to take away his loving kindness from you and send you into that burning fiery furnace. It just simply won't happen. That's why I like showing people this verse because, hey, it says, look, you need to be born again. You need to be born into God's family because before you get saved, you are not in God's family. But let's, I'm going to prove this to you. Let's look at the scripture because Nicodemus didn't understand this. He said, Nicodemus saith unto him in verse 4, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's saying, wait a minute. How is this even possible? What do you mean born again? Like, I'm a grown man. There's no way I'm going to be able to go in my mother's womb and then and she's going to give birth to me again. Like, what are you talking about? Right? He, he, he doesn't get it at all. So Jesus answered him. He explains it. Verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And this is where people say, oh, yeah, see, born of water, that means you have to be baptized. Does he say baptized there? No. Not once. He says nothing about baptism. He says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Sounds like two different births to me, right? One birth is born of water. The other birth is born of the Spirit. Now, when a child is born into this world, and I know this from having three of my own and another on the way, you know what happens right before the birth? The water breaks, right? The woman's water breaks, and then shortly after that, the child comes into, hopefully shortly after that, the child comes into this, in this earth. But um, that's being born of water. It's the physical birth. And Jesus even explains this also. He's saying, look, you have the physical birth, and then you have the spiritual birth. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. So he, for, he's, in verse 5, he's saying you have to be born of water and of the spirit. And then he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Everybody has the fleshly birth, the physical birth into this world. Not everybody has the spiritual birth. And he's saying you need to have that spiritual birth. That is the rebirth. That is the new birth that you must have in order to go into heaven. That has nothing to do with baptism. We see baptism nowhere in this chapter except well, until much later on when John is baptizing people and Jesus is baptizing people is what it says later on after, after Jesus is done speaking with Nicodemus. Because he continues on here, obviously he's not talking about baptism. If that's what you needed to be saved, why then, as we continue on through this chapter, does Jesus say all of these verses then you know, in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Nowhere do you see baptism. It's not there. Over and over again, you're going to see 
Whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth. Look, you have eternal life. You're not damned. You're not condemned. You have eternal life. It's everlasting. That is where the salvation lies. But they'll try to take this phrase, born of water, and say, oh yeah, that's baptism. And that's what baptism. Or they'll turn to Mark 16 and they'll say, um, in verse Mark, you don't have to turn there. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Right? And this is the other, this and then Acts chapter 2 are the verses that people who believe that baptism saves must, you know, you must be baptized in order to be saved. That's not true. You have hundreds, if not thousands of scripture that says, Believing is what you need to do to be saved. And you have one or two verses where it doesn't say you have to be baptized. It just says, and I'll quote it for you, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That statement is completely true. Who here believes on Jesus Christ for their salvation? Every hand. Who here has been baptized? Okay? Everybody here. You believe and you're baptized. Are you saved? Amen. Yes. Whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, yeah, you're all saved. But guess what? The saving part had nothing to do with the baptism. It just, as soon as you start, you could add anything to that. He that believeth and is a Baptist is saved. He that believeth and is a man is saved. He that believeth and is a woman is saved. He that believeth and is wearing a blue shirt is saved, right? You can say you could add any of those things to that statement and the statement remains true based on the way it's worded here. Now, if it were to say something you must believe and be baptized to be saved, then that would be a different statement. Then that would be saying it's a requirement. It's it's it, it's something that's necessary. But Acts 16 is a very clear verse in verses uh, 30 31 32, we have the, the jailer, and he says, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. No mention of baptism. And they say, oh yeah, but he got baptized later. Yeah, well, yeah, we're supposed to get baptized, but it's not a part of salvation. When he asked the question, their response was to believe. And people will try to turn to Acts chapter 2 and they'll, they'll use a verse like uh, Acts 2.32 30, because he, but see they don't want to read 37. Acts 2.37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now what must I do to be saved and what shall we do? Are those exactly the same thing? No. What should we do? What shall we do? What should we do? Is what he's saying. What should we do? And they said, look at Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, should a person repent? Yes. Should a person be baptized? Yes. Of course. Those are things that we should do. But if a person does not get baptized, does that mean that they're not saved? No. But if you're, if you're, if you're going to ask me, what should I do? I'm going to say, hey, you should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You should get baptized. You should obey every single commandment in the Word of God. That's something that you should do. Now, if you don't do that, does that just mean, oh, you're not saved then? No. But they get hung up, too, on the wording where it says, for the remission of sins. It says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The word for doesn't mean in order to attain the remission of sins. The for means because of the remission of sins. Just like you see a wanted, you know, someone's wanted for murder. Those wanted for murder signs isn't because, hey, I want this guy to go and, and kill for me. <laughs> In order to achieve a murder, this is what I want. No, that's not what those signs are for. It's wanted because of murder. That's the way that the, the English language works, especially in the older language. Wanted for, or here, the, for the remission of sins is because of the remission of sins. Very simple explanations for this. Now, you really have to take that verse and first not interpret it right just because of the way the, the language is worded. But also then, when you say you have to be baptized to be saved, you are contradicting a host of other scriptures. I mean, it's just... It, 
<clears throat> you can't have these statements, all of these, these conversations that people have specifically regarding salvation. I mean, the, the jailer was specifically asking about salvation. No mention of baptism. The Nicodemus was, you know, Jesus was specifically talking about salvation. No mention of baptism. G even in this, even in uh, chapter 4, it says in verse 2, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So all of these references about Jesus baptizing, it's saying, look, Jesus didn't even baptize these people. His disciples were doing it. Now, it was being told and referred to that Jesus was baptizing all these people, but he wasn't even doing it. If Jesus came to be the Savior of the world, wouldn't he then be baptizing people if they needed to be baptized for salvation? Or as the Apostle Paul said that in uh, 1 Corinthians, he said, For God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Amen. The gospel has nothing to do with baptism. The gospel is what saves you. What I want to know if baptism is, is required for salvation, then what did people do before baptism? I mean, John the Baptist was the first person to even start doing baptisms. Right. Did Jesus need to be saved? And here's, you know, one of their statements was in the Catholic Church, hey, the baptism is what erases original sin. Well, what erased original sin before baptism? In original sin, I have a whole sermon on that. I'm not going to get into that. But original sin, basically what they believe about original sin is that because of Adam's transgression, because of Adam disobeying God, that basically his sin is imputed unto all of us. Now, we believe that because of Adam's sin, we have a sinful nature. It's, it's something that's part of our, our fleshly nature that we have, that, that we have these desires to sin. But it's not that, that Adam's specific sin is imputed unto us, that we're just guilty before God because of something that Adam did. But that's what they believe about original sin, is that there is a guilt hung over your head. That's why they do infant baptisms. That's why they even go through with that, is because they believe, hey, there's this original sin. We don't know what's going to happen to this child. They might go to purgatory or hell or whatever if we don't get them baptized, so they baptize them right away. Which, of course, that doesn't stand up to Scripture either. When you look at the book of Acts, chapter 8, um, verse 37, when, you know, when the Philip was preaching the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, the eunuch asks him, they come up to water, you know, Philip's preaching him the gospel, they're in his chariot, and, and he's preaching him Jesus Christ. The eunuch sees this water as they're, as they're driving by, and he's like, hey, wait, there's some water right there. Why can't I be baptized? He says, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Why can't, why can't I go get baptized right now? And Philip says, okay. He says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then that was sufficient for him to go down and baptize him. But he was not going to baptize him prior to that. So tell me, how is an infant, how is a little baby going to tell you that they believe on Jesus Christ and that they're trusting in him? They can't do it. But this is the scriptural requirement that is necessary in order for a person to even be baptized. But it's because they believe in that original sin nonsense. Now, if original sin is true, what, what about Jesus Christ? Did he have original sin? He was born of a woman. He was born of Mary. But see, and, that, and this is why, you know, when you start introducing false doctrine, it impacts everything else. You need to start twisting and changing other forms, other doctrines, other things that you believe in in order to make this all fit. And that's why they've elevated Mary to like a status of, of someone who's without sin. I mean, there's a lot of people that believe the Catholic Church, and I don't know if this is official doctrine or not, um, but they believe that, that Mary even was sinless. Mm -hmm. They called Mary the mother of God, right? It's blasphemous. Just because she was used as the vessel to carry the Lord Jesus Christ in her womb, you know, obviously we believe that Mary was a great person, a great Christian, you know, but, but that's all she was. She is nothing more than that. She was a human being who had sin. She's a human being that had problems just like all of us. She wasn't always right. Jesus even, you know, rebukes her when, he, when she refers to Joseph as, as, her father, as his father. When in Luke chapter 2, when she says, you know, you know, your father and I have sought thee. And he's like, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? When he was in the temple and, and talking to the doctors and the, and the scribes and Pharisees. But you see, when you start looking at this real critically, 
it introduces other problems. And that's why they have to start mixing this up and say, oh, well, well, see, Mary didn't have sin either, so she didn't have original sin, so then that wasn't passed out to Jesus because she was a pure vessel, you know, all this other nonsense. <clears throat> because they can't, it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't fit. Instead of just tossing out the, the bad doctrine and just saying, well, yeah, this isn't right because it doesn't match up with Scripture. No, they want to cling to that because they teach lies. But... Um, And I, just so you know what, um, I'll read that for you from their, from their doctrine. It's in their, their Catechism 405. reads, Although it is proper to each individual, original sin does not have the character of a personal fault in any of Adam's descendants. It is a deprivation of original holiness and justice, but human nature has not been totally corrupted. It is wounded in the natural powers proper to it, subject to ignorance, suffering and the dominion of death and inclined to sin an inclination to evil that is called concupiscence baptism by imparting the life of Christ's grace erases original sin and turns a man back towards God okay if baptism does all that then why did Jesus get baptized did he impart his own life unto himself for that grace did he erase his original sin? Did he have to turn back towards God? But this is what they believe. This is what they teach. This is what they say. It makes no sense. Let's look at their second thing. And, and you know, I'll probably spend the rest of the time on this point because it's the biggest point anyways. There's a lot of points to refute here. But... The biggest thing, what it boils down to, is works. Because no matter how you package this, baptism can be viewed as a work. Right? Keeping the sacraments, the Eucharist, you know, they, they believe all kinds of weird things about the Eucharist that when you take that little wafer that they gave you, that it literally becomes Jesus Christ's flesh in your mouth as you're eating it. It's like this bizarre cannibalism. And you know why all this stuff happens? They are just like the Pharisees that don't understand. They're just like the unsaved Nicodemus. Oh, and that was another point I want to make just about that baptism thing. Oh, is that quote on here? There it is. Okay, in 1250, I'm going to read this for you because their quote, the quote from the Bible in John 3 was, except a man be born born of water and of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. They say, this is why she takes care not to neglect the mission she has received from the Lord to see that all who can be baptized are reborn of water and the Spirit. So they change being born of water to being reborn of water. So wait a minute, if we're reborn of water, that's what Nicodemus was saying. How can I go the second time in my mother's womb and be born again of water? They don't understand this the same way that Nicodemus didn't understand this. The same way that they don't understand any of the, you know, any, any of the aspects of salvation. They have blinders on and they're, they're, they're groping to try to understand God's word. But the reason why they don't understand it is because they don't believe it. But the works, and I thought that was amazing. They, they change it to reborn of water. It doesn't say reborn of water. It says born of water. That's one time. You don't, you don't get born of water twice. And born of the Spirit. You get born of the Spirit once as well. That's not something you need to get have reborn over and over and over again. You have one birth. One physical birth, and then you have one spiritual birth. And that's it. You don't need to continually have multiple births of the, of the same thing after that. But let's look at, uh, if, turn if you would to Romans chapter 3. Because all these works that are listed up as far as maintaining salvation and you know, participating in the, sa in the sacraments and doing all this stuff in order to attain salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, meaning not of the things that you can do, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Very clearly, again, and anybody, whether it's Catholics or anyone else, 
who wants to teach you a works-based salvation, they'll bring you to verses that have nothing to do with salvation. But notice, as we read these scriptures, what we're talking about. In context, what are we referring to? In that verse, it says, you are saved. You're saved through faith. It's talking about salvation. When we're talking about eternal life, when we're talking about everlasting life, when we're talking about justification, when we're talking about redemption, all of these words are used in context with how we're saved. Those are saving terms. Those are terms that are used about salvation. But what they like to do is turn to other verses where salvation is never once even mentioned. Eternal life is never mentioned. Everlasting life, you know, these, these phrases that talk about the kingdom of God isn't mentioned, right? And they'll turn to these things and say, see, this is why you have to do works to be saved. It doesn't say anything about works. Very clear at verse though, Ephesians 2. You're saved by grace, not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's something that's given to you. And it's not of works, very clearly stated. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Look at Romans 3, verse 24. Great verses to highlight in your Bibles, too, by the way, when you're out soul winning, because all of these are very good about explaining uh, the free gift of salvation. Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice the words, justified, redemption, freely, grace. Grace is something you don't deserve, but you still receive as a gift. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. They'll say, well, no, you need faith, but you also need to, to follow the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are huge in the Catholic Church. People say, no, no, you still got to follow the Ten Commandments. Well, then why does this say we're justified? We are made just in God's eyes by faith without the deeds of law. So this is, someone, this is saying that if someone has faith and they don't follow any of the law, they have no deeds of the law, they're justified in God's eyes. That's the conclusion of everything that he said up to that point in Romans chapter 3. He says, this is our conclusion. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Flip over to Romans 4. Romans chapter 4 talks about Abraham in the Old Testament. Same thing. New Testament, Old Testament, it doesn't matter when you get saved. It's always been the same. Romans chapter 4 verse number 1 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, I understand this is a little bit older language. Let me break it down for you. What he's saying is that if you are working, if you are doing work for somebody, some type of work, the reward that you get, the, the payment, whatever it is that you are given as a result of your work, that is not grace. That is debt because it's owed to you. The, the example I always like using for this is when I go to work. I've been hired, I've been employed to do a job. And there is an agreed you know, payment that's to be made when I put in my work, you know, whether it's hourly pay, salary pay, whatever, it doesn't matter. I do the work and then I receive a paycheck, a reward, right? Well, that's not grace. That's not something that's freely given to me. They say, like, oh, hey, here's this gift. Here you go. Here's your pay. You know, no, I've earned that. I've worked for that. And what he's trying to explain here is that salvation cannot be earned. It can't be worked for. Amen. It has to be freely given. And if you are working for it, if you have to obey God's laws in order to be saved, then you can't be saved because you've already broken them. And he's, he's explaining this, this great definition. We're going to see it again in Romans 11 right after this. That the, the, you know, this, this very clear defining of terms 
that, look, if you work for something, that is not grace. But verse number five here in Romans four says, but to him that worketh not does no good works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The faith is, is all that is necessary, is all that is required in order for you to, to be considered righteous in God's eyes. Because Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed unto you when you receive him, when you believe on him, when you trust on him as your savior, all of the great works that Jesus Christ did on this earth gets imputed onto your account. So not only does he clear your sins away and wash them in his blood so that they're gone and, and forgotten and done with, you also get imputed with his righteousness. So then God could say, well, you are righteous. Now you do deserve to go into heaven. You are allowed to get in heaven because what Jesus did is, a, is attributed to you and now you're allowed to get in. And, and that's why it's saying, you know, it has nothing to do with our personal works that's going to give us that salvation. Because it's grace, because it's something we don't deserve, but it's given to us anyways. Romans 11, look at verse number 5 of Romans 11. Romans 11, 5. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Again, very, now you might be like, what? You know, you look at that and it could be kind of confusing. But when you take your time and read through it, what it's saying is that grace and works are completely separated. You can't mix the two. As soon as you try to mix grace with works, it becomes works. You cannot, because, because by definition, grace is without any works. You cannot have grace and still have it be grace if you're adding something where works because it's, then you're earning your reward. Then that's no longer grace. It's nothing to you. If I wanted to give you this Bible, this Bible is probably about $50. And I wanted to give this Bible to you. That's the value of this book, right? This that I'm holding my hand just the, for the leather binding, pages, all this stuff. The value is probably around $50. In order for this to truly, if it were truly to be grace, I would just have to give it to you without receiving anything in return. Don't take it yet. No. <laughs> now, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to give this to you, you know, out of, out of the grace of my heart, I want you to have this, but you've got to give me a penny. It's not very much I'm adding to that. But as soon as I add a dollar amount, as soon as there's something that, well, now I have to give something, that's no longer grace. If he says, what if he says, well, I don't have a penny, and I, you know, I, I can't give you a penny. If I still give it to him, that's grace. But if I say, nope, you can't have it then because I have to have that penny. You say, but it's such a small fraction of what you paid for it. I know. But that's no longer grace then. Now he's buying it. It's a, it may be a very, very, very good deal. A great deal. But that's not grace. He just bought it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, that type of a transaction. As soon as we start adding our own works, whatever that may be, well, oh God, I didn't kill anybody. Well, good for you. You didn't kill somebody, right? What about everything else that you've done? As soon as you add, oh, but you know, I gave money to church every single week. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What do you, he doesn't care about your money. I visited the, the, the fatherless and widows that week. Hey, that's great. Are you trying to buy your way into heaven? Because you can't. You can't do it. These terms are, are defined, well defined in the Bible. Romans 4, Romans 11. He's saying, look, grace is grace. It's completely free. You cannot mix the two. So if you're going to try to tell me that salvation is by grace, but then you also have to obey the law, you're mixing grace and works. It's become works. Turn if you to Galatians chapter 2. Now look. I didn't, I didn't really mention this in the beginning of the sermon, but this isn't an attack against Catholic people, this sermon. It's against the teaching of the Catholic Church, absolutely, because they are damning souls and sending them to hell with their wicked, false religion and teaching people lies 
that you have to work in order to make it to heaven. This is a solid attack against that. But the people who have been lied to and deceived to, it's not against them. This isn't against you know, that person that I spent so much time talking to. You know, this sermon isn't against him. It's actually for their benefit because they need to understand this is what the Bible says and this is why your religion is false. This is why they're lying to you because the Bible says something completely different than what they're teaching you and they're sending you to hell. And I don't care if your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, great-grandfather, we're all part of that religion. And this is another problem that people have. They'll say, well, you know, why would my family lie to me? They wouldn't lie to me, so I'm going to, you know, you, you trust, because inherently you trust what your parents say, you're brought up, you know that they love you, you know they care for you. And yes, that's true, they do love you, they do care for you, but if they've been deceived and they think something's true, you know, it's not that they have malintent and say, ah, oh, I want my child to burn in hell forever. No, they've just been tricked. And you have to be able to separate that, that just because you've been brought up a certain way, doesn't mean you have to just continue that way because you have to determine for yourself what is true, what is right. They're ignorant of what the truth is. They're teaching you a wrong way. It's not out of maliciousness. It's just because they don't know. You need to be able to see what the Bible says, what God's Word says, and don't trust in man's wisdom. Don't trust in this man-made religion of Roman Catholicism. Trust in what the Bible says. And the Bible says in Galatians 2, verse 16, Knowing that a man is not justified, there's that word again, justified, is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There are so many crystal clear verses in the Bible that tell us flat out, Look, the law has nothing to do with this. We are separating the law from our salvation because salvation is a free gift that's given by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the works are just works of the law. They're dead works that cannot save. Look at, jump, uh, jump down to verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If we can be righteous based on our obedience to God's law, then there's no reason for Jesus to die. And then flip over to Galatians 5 because they'll use these terms and say, oh, well, people f can fall from grace, right? So, and a lot of people use this phrase too, this, uh, you know, trying to say you could lose your salvation. What's really interesting is that the only time you're going to find fall from grace in the Bible is here in Galatians chapter 5. And look what it's referring to. Verse number 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law ye are fallen from grace. And they'll try to tell you, oh, if someone commits a murder, that's a mortal sin, and they're fallen from grace because they've broken the law. They're saying, no, if you're trying to be justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Because you are not trusting in God's grace. You are trusting in your own works and your own merits and in your own obedience to God's law. If you're trusting in that, yeah, you are fallen from grace. You, you have not received grace. But it doesn't mean you lose your salvation. You're saying, look, if you're, if you're justified by the law, you are falling from grace. But they twist that to mean the exact opposite of saying, well, you've broken these commandments, so now you're falling from grace. No, that's not what the Bible says here at all. And this is the only time you're going to find that phrase, fallen from grace, in the whole Bible. And it's referring to people who are trusting in the law and not trusting in the grace of God. Real quickly, I'm going to go over this concept of their, their big sins versus little sins, their venial versus mortal sins. It's another teaching of the Catholic Church, which is why things get so complicated. They'll try to t turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. That's one of the reasons why their salvation is so complicated, because, well, if you do this sin, then in order to make up for that sin, all you have to do is confess it to the Father, you know, in this box, and He'll tell you the penance that you have to do, which is just chant a, a, a vain, repetitious prayer, you know, 20 times or 50 times, and you'll have to, you know, it's like, it's like writing lines on the chalkboard at school, <laughs> right? That's your punishment. This is what you have to do. And it's ridiculous. And, and you know, I, I was talking to this guy, and... I mean, I, I couldn't help, I wasn't trying to be rude because I, I, was, I was honestly trying to win him in love. I was trying to show him this, but when people tell me like, like that that somehow absolves you of your sin, by, he's like, well, you do this penance, and I'm like, that's a joke. 
And he even, you know, he was going to say, well, you don't have to mock, you know, I was just like, but how can you say that this, that this makes up for these sins? That you just, just reciting, you know, I said, it's a vain repetition. He said, well, no, it's not. He said, you're supposed to say it and mean it every single time. He said, but even if you're supposed to say it and mean it every single time, how can just a certain, rep a certain number of times of praying something, how is that just, just make up for what you've done? That's what, how can that, how is that even possible? But they say, sit still. They say that this is, that's what they believe, that there's certain sins that, well, this will make it okay. But that's, and that's not a mortal sin, right? The mortal sins are the really bad ones where like, you lose your salvation over that. But look at James 2, verse number 8. The Bible reads, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He's saying as soon as you break God's law, you break one of His commandments, I mean, you might as well just be guilty of all of His commandments. He's not putting one above the other as far as, you know, having a punishment to pay for your sins. That's why in Revelation 21.8, you know, the, the very famous verse that we use out soul winning, it's the Bible says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. So you're going to see a mixture here. You're going to see, okay, abominable, right? Things that people could do that God just absolutely hates. It's an abomination in His sight, right? A strong language. And murderers, right? Real bad sin. I mean, taking someone else's life. <laughs> Sit still. And whoremongers, people who sleep around. And sorcerers, right? These real bad things. But the first two things it says, it says but the fearful. Are you going to say, like the Catholic, are you going to say... Being fearful is on par with a murderer. So they'll say, no, that's a, being fearful is more of a, a, a venial sin, right? But a murder is a mortal sin. Then why does Revelation 21.8 combine all of them together? It says, and idolaters, don't forget that one Catholic who's, who's worshiping and bowing down to statues, graven images of people, of, of things that, are, that God specifically told us in the Ten Commandments that you want to follow, not to do, you are bowing down and worshiping these things. Idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Looks to me like all of those sins are worthy of hell. All of those sins are mortal sins. Amen. They all deserve that punishment. Whether you're fearful, whether you're unbelieving, whether you're a murderer, whether you're a liar, whether you're an idolater, they all are sins worthy of hell. There is no other justification or absolution of your sins other than faith in Christ. They're all mortal sins. They all need to be washed through Christ. You cannot attain your salvation by means of repeating a vain repetition, by repeating a prayer. Even if you say it's not vain, no, I mean it every single time. I don't care. Saying those words over and over again to God doesn't just make it okay. It doesn't. It doesn't make it go away. And then, of course, they have the other sacraments, but I'm not going to get into the other sacraments. It's all works. It all boils down to different works that you have to do. Whether it's taking the Eucharist, whether it's confessing your sins, whether it doesn't matter what it is, it boils down to you having to do other things, keeping some obedience to the law in order to attain your salvation. That's why a Catholic is not saved. And I wanted to point out this one last um, thing here. There's in their catechism, it's number 2027. 2027 reads this. It says, this is, this is one of the things that the Catholic Church teaches and believes. Stop. No one can merit the initial grace which is at the origin of conversion. So they're saying, so they'll look at these verses and say like, that's not merited by you the very first time you believe, right? But it's, you have to maintain this later on through works. So all of these verses that we looked at, they'll say, oh yeah, that's probably all just, it's all just about that initial conversion. That's not warranted. That's, that's by grace. But look what it says. It says, moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life as well as necessary temporal goods. 
Remember when we looked at those definitions about grace and reward, like especially in Romans chapter 4? They're saying here, we can merit, which means we can deserve by doing good works. We can earn, we can merit for ourselves and for others all the graces. How can we deserve and earn a grace? It's a, it's a contradiction of terms laid out in the Bible. But they're saying we can earn God's grace. We can work for it. We can achieve it for ourselves and for others. You thinking a little high of yourself there that, hey, I could merit God's grace for me and for all these other people? What, are you Jesus Christ? Because he was the only one that merited any of that worth. He was the one that was perfectly sinless. He was the one that gave himself in order for all of us to be saved. He was the one that was pure and acceptable and unspotted before God and perfectly kept. And he was the one that was actually worthy of attaining salvation and was able to work for that great reward. He did the works necessary. We can't do that. And when you say things like this, you are putting yourself on par with Jesus Christ. Our righteousnesses, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as unclean things and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have, ta have taken us away. In God's sight, you know, when you think you're so good and you're doing all this great stuff and you're helping people out so much, your righteousness in God's eyes is like filthy rags. It's a dirty rag. It does not measure up. Without Christ. With Christ, it's all clean. That's why we're going to get white garments. Completely what's unspotted. Because it's, it's Jesus' righteousness imputed unto us. Jesus Christ himself said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. The Catholics think that you can be good enough to earn graces for yourself and for others. There's none good. God is the only one that's good. Last verse, turn to Titus chapter 3. I'm going to close on this scripture. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse number 4 reads, But after that the, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All these scriptures that we're looking at today, they're talking about being justified. They're all referring to justification by God's grace through faith. We saw the scriptures that, that define grace versus works. You cannot mix the two. They're inseparable. And our salvation, our righteousness, our eternal life all comes directly through faith in Jesus Christ and not of works. <clears throat> and as I mentioned at the very beginning of the sermon, you know, this can be applied towards just about anybody. You know, the, obviously these verses apply to everybody. We went over some specific teachings that the Catholic Church teaches our requirements for salvation. But honestly... Anybody who's not saved is believing in some kind of a work. They're believing in some sort of, you know, whether they think, well, you're saved by grace, but you could lose your salvation when you do something bad. You're relying on your, your obedience to God's law. Let's make sure we can go out there, even though there's all these, these false religions, false teachers that are, that are perverting God's truth, perverting the gospel, we're going to fight against that, but let's go out and get these people saved that are, that are believing incorrectly and that, that have the blinders on. They've been lied to. And let's just show, you know, hopefully there's some verse in here maybe that you don't normally use out soul winning, but that, um, you know, that helps explain things better for you. And um, you can incorporate this when you're trying to explain, especially the difference between works and grace, um, so that people can get that complete understanding of what it is that they need to believe to be saved. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the truth. We thank you for your words that you've given to us, dear God. Pray that you would please just um, help us all to become better soul winners. Help us to teach this great truth unto people. There's so many people that, are, that 
will call themselves Catholic, that subscribe to the Catholic faith, dear Lord, and it's so completely perverted and leading so many people to hell. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to be able to reach those people that have been deceived, that have been lied to, to, to shine forth the glorious gospel and that, and that uh, you'd be able to pierce through the hearts and minds of those people that are lost, dear God. And I pray that you would please just empower us to do that this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.